Hey everyone, welcome to the 2020 Bootcamp Webinar Short Course. My name is Allegra Rockledge and I'm the Program Manager with the Conservation Finance Network, CFN. First off, I want to thank everyone for joining us today who applied to the 2020 Conservation Finance Bootcamp, as well as all of CFN's partners and supporters who are on the line with us. This is our 14th year of the bootcamp and well, we're still really disappointed that we can't all gather everyone together in person this June as usual. We're still excited to reach a larger audience by offering some of the content from our bootcamp via webinar for the very first time. The 2020 bootcamp webinar short course will explore the latest trends and strategies in funding and financing that are being put to work for land and resource conservation. With an emphasis on hands-on tools and lessons from relevant case studies, through this series, we'll be exploring a series of innovative and overlooked opportunities in conservation finance. I wanna start off with a really big thank you to the Yale Center for Business and the Environment, CBE, who we're partnering with for this webinar series. CBE is a longtime partner of CFN, and in a little bit, you'll learn more about the origins of the boot camp at Yale, our original partner for the course. The in-person boot camp this year was also planned to be held at Yale, and we really appreciate CBE's partnership and support as they worked with us to move this content to a webinar format. They are hosting the webinar series on their platform today, so we so appreciate that. Through our partnership, I also want to mention that CBE hosts CFN's website, where we post original content and updates in the conservation finance field with the help of a team of Yale master's student writers. So thank you again to CBE for your partnership. I also wanna say thank you to our funders who are supporting the 2020 Conservation Finance Bootcamp, the William Penn Foundation, and also John Earhart, whose support came via the Tides Foundation. We really appreciate your support, especially as we navigate the uncertainty of COVID-related restrictions on in-person meetings and all of them working with us to pivot to this webinar series. For those of you who applied to the in-person boot camp this year, I want to say that we still have your applications and we're still working to determine if an in-person course in late 2020 is safe and feasible. We're hoping to make a final determination on that in July or August, so we'll reach out to you all then when we have more information. This webinar series has four parts. For the two sessions today, we'll walk you through an overview of conservation finance strategies and also build your understanding of financial terms and concepts. These sessions today are going to provide the building blocks for the discussions that we'll have on Thursday, where we'll be hosting a panel of experts to discuss new developments in their work, putting public, private, and philanthropic dollars towards conservation. This session, The Evolution of Conservation Finance, is the first in our four-part series. And I'll be joined by Lee Welpton, Program Director for CFN, as well as Brad Gentry and Peter Stein, who are co-founders of the network. I'll let them introduce themselves in just a minute. And for this session, they're going to provide an overview of how conservation finance approaches have evolved, exploring current trends and a range of conservation funding and financing strategies. They're also going to provide a little bit of history and overview of how CFN works and also the role of the boot camp over the past 14 years. Before we begin, just a couple of logistics items. These webinars are being offered live to applicants of the 2020 boot camp and select CFN partners. We are recording these webinars, so they'll be publicly available on our website at a later date if you have colleagues or partners who might be interested in viewing them. Participants will also be kept on mute throughout these presentations, so if you do have questions, please type them into the Q&A box, and then we'll save time to answer those at the end of the session. I'll be moderating the Q&A. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Lee, and she'll kick off the presentation with some introductions. Hey everyone, um, sorry to not be filling your bellies with snacks and convening in the halls of Kroon Hall. Um, we are nevertheless excited to have everyone with us today and uh, also on Thursday for the four part short course series. 
My name is Lee. I'm the director of the Conservation Finance Network. And we are thrilled to be joined today um, by Brad Gentry, Frederick Warehouser Professor at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies in the School of Management, as well as co-director of the Center for Business and the Environment at Yale, uh, and my former professor and CFN co-founder, uh, as well as Peter Stein, the managing director of the Lime Timber Company and another co-founder of the Conservation Finance Network, who for some reason uh, hired me despite my inability to start a car during the job interview. Um, so I will hand it over to Brad. Uh, we've got a little back and forth planned for this session today, but uh, Brad, over to you. Thank you very much, Lee, and it's great to be with you, at least virtually, in Kroon Hall. Um, as you can see, we're, we were excited to have the camp come back to Yale, but virtually is great too. Um, so what I wanted to do is just talk a little bit about the evolution of the boot camp, which actually started with Peter Stein and um, Story Clark at the Land Trust Alliance rally, doing little sessions on where might your funding come from. And then Jim Levitt and Pat Cody sort of took that to another level with um, some work that Jim was doing on a book from Walden to Wall Street and the Lincoln Institute becoming interested in conservation finance as a topic and hosting a meeting where Story announced that she was going to do a boot camp, but she needed a place to do it. We had just been given a nice gift to support land conservation activities. So we offered to do it at Yale. And we trialed it at Yale in 2007. Um, one of the things that we wanted very much to do was to move the boot camp around the country so you'd have different regional views and many different partners involved. The first effort was at Stanford, um, but we ended up hosting the camp at Yale for quite a number of years before it went to Duke and Colorado State, University of Wyoming, and Portland State, and was supposed to come back to Yale this year. At, while the hap that was happening with the boot camp, CFN, the Conservation Finance Network, was sort of taking shape more directly, had some seed funding from the Department of Defense from their REPI program, the Base Buffer program, um, and Island Press, which had been publishing stories and gems and others' books, was intrigued to have it be hosted there. Um, we then at Yale had a lot of students that were interested in studying conservation finance. So we offered to do the web page for the, the network and that turned into this wonderful partnership there. And finally, CFN transferred over to the Conservation Fund in 2016. So that's kind of the evolution of the, both the network and the boot camp. Lee, if you could go to the next, or Allegra to the next slide. What is conservation finance? It covers a huge array of areas, probably the largest recent report and largest recent definition is that by the Conservation Finance Alliance about the range of strategies that generate, manage, and deploy financial resources and align incentives. I think for purposes of the Conservation Finance Boot Camps, we focus more on if you want somebody to hand you money across the table, where that might be, where might that be coming from? Is it a gift, philanthropic source? Is it a public source? Is it a for-profit private source? and or is it a whole bunch of different sources blending together? So that's the focus of today's discussion on the evolution, as well as the panels on Thursday about philanthropic, public, and private capital. Next slide, please, Allegra. And then if you sort of think about how those come together, there's a couple of different ways to think about it. One of them is the tax incentives for gifts that the federal and state governments offer Another one is individual philanthropic giving and institutional grant making, um, whether those are public or private. There's also opportunities to manage your conserved lands in ways that earn some income, which could be sort of normal timber things like Peter will talk about later, or could be the growing markets for sales of ecosystem services from carbons to wetlands to species banking to who knows what. Um, if you have earned income or if you have other assets, you can borrow money to help support what you're doing from a variety of sources. You might be able to, to participate in the tax credits or the tax incentives for, for making investments in land. Um, and those can support the equity investments in the last one. I think it's important to note 
that equity in this case does not mean fairness, it means ownership. Um, so if you're gonna have an equity investment in land, and we'll hear from a number of groups that are doing that around sustainable land use on Thursday. Um, the point is that from left to right, the amount of potential, the amount of money that's out there gets larger, but so does the cost and the complexity. So a lot of what you see in the land conservation area traditionally has been on the left side of this graph. Part of what we'll be doing is exploring how far you can go into the larger pots on the right side. I think next slide, please, Allegra. And that's back to you, Lee. Thanks, Brad. And since we're just getting acquainted with folks, we wanted to provide the briefest of introductions to what we do at the network. So um, in a nutshell, our theory of change really revolves around practitioners uh, and a belief that it is in fact practitioners well supported with information, connections, and even a bit of courage to implement creative funding and financing tools to solve land and resource conservation, restoration, and stewardship challenges. Um, and all of that to the point of increasing the financial resources deployed for conservation. So our focus as such is training and convening practitioners, incubating new approaches, disseminating timely and actionable information or insight in some cases. Um, we often joke that it's taking the experiential uh, knowledge contained between the ears of a lot of experts and trying to translate that into some way that it's meaningful or useful for other people. And then partnering across sector with any variety of institutions or players. Um, so if this intrigues you, please join us for more. Uh, next. And just to share that beyond the boot camp, we do a number of other things as well. Uh, some of those being providing technical assistance. Currently, we're doing so with the Sentinel Landscape Program. Uh, which is a partnership with the Department of Defense, also with conservation organizations in the Chesapeake Bay region. Uh, we're working on a very um, intense investment in a compendium showcasing the funding and financing tools, at least those that we're aware of. Uh, stay tuned for more on that. Uh, we also convene industry roundtables virtually for the moment, but hopefully in person before too, too long. Uh, and we bring together the finance and investment community uh, to really think about what the role is of things as far afield as pension funds in advancing the conservation movement and agenda with the use of their capital resources and allocations. Um, and as we've already mentioned, a really robust and rewarding partnership with the Center for Business and the Environment and I'll keep using the words around actionable and timely information and insight. So a really great partnership. Um, if we don't have a resource and you need the information, by all means, let us know. We have the apparatus that can help to develop a tool. Next. So I won't go into much more detail about CFN for now. Um, we'll invite you to get to know us, uh, if not over the course of a future in-person bootcamp than through other means. Uh, but please, if you're curious, if you're in need of information, connection, resources, et cetera, um, check out our website, sign up for our monthly e-news where we curate news from the field as well as share um, content that we have created through the partnership with you all. And we also, in addition to the books that were previously mentioned that helped form some of the foundational literature of the field, there are some new resources coming out still. Uh, and we in fact have a discount code for those of you who uh, wanna buy the books. So I'll hit the pause button on myself and pass it over to Peter. Well, thank you, Lee, and thank you, Brad, and thank you, Allegra, for getting us going. Uh, I created this slide, which is, uh, a little bit of my own personal journey <laughs> over the years with respect to conservation finance. Uh, maybe with some of you, I was crawling, so to speak, in the 70s and in the 80s and 90s, I began to walk. And eventually, I started running. Now I'm flying and with a little help from Elon Musk, maybe we'll be teleporting soon. Uh, but what I'm trying to demonstrate is sort of the uh, 
pace and growth in the scale of application of conservation finance. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I uh, started my career in the mid-1970s as one of the early staff, founding staff of a group called the Trust for Public Land, wonderful uh, land conservation NGO working all across the United States. Actually, uh, my very first job had me doing two very different things, buying gorgeous ranches uh, in Marin that became eventually became Golden Gate National Recreation Area and buying slightly less gorgeous vacant lots in East Oakland that became community gardens um, and also were the fabric that created the first urban land trusts in the United States. Um, but it was during that time that uh, I think that the real leverage was using the public charity status and securing gifts and bargain sales of land or conservation easements. Uh, at that point in time, the easement mechanism had just gotten applied to farmland. So you had the very first um, farmland trusts in the late 1970s, early 1980s, uh, early work by American farmland trusts, which began in 1980. Uh, and there was a, a great experiment uh, in Vermont, a brand new land trust, now 40 some odd years old, but Vermont land trust had a great appetite and no resources. Uh, and they were able to use the balance sheet of their board members uh, who pledged a portion of their assets as charitable creditors uh, to support a bank loan uh, to acquire a, a really critical conservation priority in South Woodstock, Vermont. So uh, that was one of the first examples of using third parties uh, as a source um, of conservation funding, uh, or at least interim financing. During uh, the 80s and 90s, a few groups started to partner with private seeking capital, some around so-called limited development or conservation development projects. Uh, groups like the Nature Conservancy had pretty robust trade land programs where um, while tax rates were still relatively high, uh, they would convince um, their donors, their friends to give them non-conservation real estate. Uh, and then they would market it and use the proceeds to invest in conservation priorities. Um, and early in the, really it was uh, the early 90s, and, and Lime Timber is a good example of this, uh, or when a very, very first foundation endowments began to make investments that were aligned with their philanthropic programmatic interests. Um, sometimes called impact investments, sometimes called double bottom line, triple bottom line investments, today more frequently called uh, mission related uh, investments. Uh, but the Jesse Smith Noise Foundation in New York City was the pioneer in doing that uh, in the very early 1990s. Uh, with a couple of other groups, but principally uh, in my uh, change in careers from Trust for Public Land to Lime Timber, you began to see uh, some uh, aggregators of capital, sort of private equity fund style capital, being deployed in partnership with conservation NGOs. Uh, so Lime Timber, Conservation Forestry, uh, eventually Hancock Timber Resource Group, or some of the timberland investment management organizations that found ways to both meet their, their profit goals, their financial goals, and use their capital to conserve land at the same time. This was really due to the expansion of the use of working forest conservation easements that also began in the early 1990s. Um, and some of the land trusts like Society for Protection of New Hampshire Forests, New England Forestry Foundation, Pacific Forest Trust, Tall Timbers in Florida and Georgia were some of the land trust innovators in using that mechanism. Uh, and while in the 90s, we might have had a single foundation that was making mission-related investment, by the early 2000s, we had a couple of dozen. Many of those had done that in another field or another interest area, uh, specifically around community development. And uh, a quest I've had during my entire career is to borrow uh, from the experience of 
the community development world and brings uh, the relevant and tractionable experiences there to the conservation world. And things like when we get into the uh, 2000s, things like the New Markets Tax Credit Program, a federal income tax credit program, which was really pioneered by community development finance institutions, uh, was repurposed a bit by a variety of CDFIs and partners like Lime Timber uh, and Ecotrust Forest Management to use that uh, income tax credit financing mechanism that was developed really for community development purposes and bring it to conservation. Uh, as I th see things going forward, uh, we'll hear a little bit uh, on Thursday, I believe, about environmental impact bonds and pay for success models. Uh, we're finally seeing uh, the assets in donor advised funds. So these are the mechanisms that a, a family or an individual might uh, use to create a philanthropic vehicle. Uh, so these are hosted by community foundations or the for-profit donor advised fund uh, entities like Fidelity or Vanguard or Charles Schwab, uh, and uh, a very interesting group uh, based in Massachusetts called CapShare has come up with a pretty simple, straightforward way of accessing donor advised funds for impact investing purposes. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, we're gonna get into the, these in a lot more detail. Uh, uh, hopefully all of you were cheering alongside me last Monday or Tuesday when uh, the Senate passed the uh, legislation that would create permanent funding at the full authorized appropriation level, $900 million a year for the Land and Water Conservation Fund, uh, an even larger source of conservation dollars at the federal level are sourced through the Farm Bill. Uh, depending on which state you're from, uh, you may be very involved in uh, in supporting and creating uh, and continuing to keep authorized some of the state funding programs. There's a $3 billion climate uh, bond in New York State that will go to the voters in November. Um, and that's an example of that. And then we have some interesting, these are congressionally chartered nonprofits that play a role many times with mitigation funds or natural resource damage assessment monies. And examples would be the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and the National Park Foundation. Uh, we're going to have a whole session on how this money comes uh, to exist. Uh, if you're in New Jersey, an awful lot of it is property tax related. So I think there are over 200 jurisdictions in the Garden State that have mechanisms where a portion of the property tax receipts are dedicated to land conservation. If you happen to be in Iowa, it's a sales tax. Um, if you happen to be in, in Colorado, it's uh, not that I'm recommending you buy lottery tickets, but if you lose, it's good news because the lottery proceeds go to land conservation through the Great Outdoors Colorado Trust. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, you know, there's a, a modest improvement in charitable giving as part of the CARES Act. Uh, in, uh, in a number of jurisdictions around the country, uh, possibly led by some of the pioneering efforts in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, total maximum daily loads uh, are being reduced through land conservation investments. And there's now uh, in the Chesapeake, for example, accrediting system to acknowledge and count the uh, numbers of acres that are permanently conserved towards the towards meeting the TMDL goals for the Chesapeake. Uh, California would be a great example where part of the allowance proceeds from greenhouse gas emitters as part of the global warming. Uh, act in California, a portion of those allowance proceeds, those payments to the state of California are actually used to pay for forest land conservation in the state of California. Uh, and uh, as long as there are enough signatures and enough people vote the right way and 
in November in Montana, uh, there will be a state tax, new state tax revenue source associated with the legalization of marijuana. Let's go to the next slide. So, uh, at least in my experience, many uh, state agencies, local agencies, land trusts uh, don't always have the necessary capital at the moment a transaction needs to occur, meaning the seller wants to close. Uh, the public agency dollars may be a year away or a couple of competitive grant cycles away. Um, and so some foundations are making loans. Uh, some uh, NGOs like the Conservation Fund have very robust loan programs. Uh, and that's just an example of how interim financing comes together. Uh, in a few jurisdictions, land trusts have had success having concessionary priced loans uh, delivered to them by banks uh, who are meeting their Community Reinvestment Act obligations. Uh, there are a couple of white papers about this that are available from the CFN website, but it's a great example of using a federal regulation to incentivize a, a local bank or a regional bank uh, to be available uh, to be a lender. Uh, we're going to spend uh, time again uh, on Thursday looking into the clean water and safe drinking water revolving loan funds. Many, many states now, eight states, nine states, have sponsorship programs that allow uh, both localities, units of government, and nonprofits to borrow from those loan programs, um, provided there's an authentic and measurable water quality benefit associated with those financings. That was pioneered in Ohio, but literally there are eight other states. Uh, just in the last two years, Vermont has become quite a leader in regard to accessing SRF debt. And then uh, a number of states have entered the green bond market and Massachusetts happened to include uh, debt associated with their capital expenditures for land conservation in their most recent green bond. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I don't have to tell any of you who work for NGOs, you're probably great at uh, making sure you stay in good contact with your donor base and with those foundations that support you and we're always doing research and networking to find other sources of philanthropic support. Uh, many land trusts have used their public charity status as leverage to get gifts and bargain sales. Uh, some have evolved uh, into partnerships with local businesses, uh, a bit like a voluntary surcharge program. Uh, and we're beginning to see uh, roles played by corporate philanthropy, particularly around climate issues and conservation. And a great example there uh, is the aggregated carbon project in, in northern Vermont, where uh, Amazon is the philanthropic partner um, in the offtakes of those carbon credits. Uh, some land trusts have now uh, experimented with crowdsource or um, uh, microfinancing approaches to fundraising for capital uh, campaigns, uh, program-related investments, which I thought of as a new idea, uh, having worked on the very first conservation-oriented program-related investment at the Ford Foundation in the mid-1980s is unfortunately still kind of a new idea, which means there's plenty of opportunity uh, to describe it as innovative for foundations that you might approach who would be interested in that. And uh, as I talked before, we're now seeing uh, significant commitments by philanthropic endowments, so foundation endowments, to make mission-related investments that might have a conservation or natural resource sustainability focus. Uh, in times of this pandemic, uh, and to recognize a little bit more uh, the interests in the land conservation community serving underserved populations, uh, I think it's increasingly important to uh, describe and measure and monitor the intersection between land conservation and public health. Uh, and I know that a number of you are already working on, on that. 
Next slide. Uh, we talked about charitable creditors. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, institutional investments in real assets, it's principally real estate, oil and gas, timber, farmland, and water resources are the ways, um, the types of real assets that, that um, institutional investors invest in. Timber really is still a little bit new in that most timberland was locked up, so to speak, in publicly traded companies for as long as 100 years. Uh, and only in the last 20, 25 years has that uh, divestiture from those companies really come full circle. And now the lion's share of large-scale timberland ownership in the United States is through Timberland Investment Management Organizations, a number of which are partnering with land trusts and NGOs to pursue working forest conservation easements or other ecosystem service related transactions. Uh, a number of land trusts and private developers have partnered uh, in what I refer to as creative land development schemes where a portion of the property is developed and that pays for the conservation of the balance of the property. That's been do, done principally with private capital. Uh, every now and then a land trust might bring some capital to the table, but principally it's done with private capital. And then a number of land trusts over the years have had pretty robust conservation buyer programs. I'm thinking of Maine Coast Heritage Trust and the Jackson Hole Land Trust, where the current owner may not be in a position to do long-term conservation. They're going to put the property up for sale and the land trust plays the role of matchmaker, uh, brings in a new owner um, and that new owner is the one that the land trust recruits to do a conservation transaction. Uh, impact angel investors, principally these are family offices. Uh, we're seeing more and more where the next generation in the family office are looking to see alignment between making money and the process by which the money is made, uh, having both social and environmental outcomes. Uh, and we're just seeing more and more of that. If you wanna go to uh, get more detailed information, groups like uh, the impact, groups like Mission Investor Exchange are the places to go. Next slide. So um, in the for-profit world, what, when I first started Lime Timber, our very first fund was $65 million. Uh, that was really not big enough to recruit or, or interest institutional money. Our last fund uh, was $300 million and 70% of the capital came from 10 investors, uh, a number of which were large scale institutions. Uh, the uh, mitigation funds that are out there, I'm thinking of uh, ecosystem investment partners and resource environmental services as two examples, are all in the multi hundred million dollar scheme and have both US and non US institutional investors uh, as their capital base. We are also beginning to see the growth of the sustainable ag funds. Conventional ag has always been a big sector for institutional real asset investors. Those funds are gigantic, but it's only in the last couple of years, I'm thinking of Farmland LP, Iroquois Valley Farms, Dirt Capital, Black Dirt Capital, sustained land, Sustainable Land Management Partners as, as examples of uh, sustainable agriculture investment vehicles that are growing uh, to begin to be at a size that will allow them to recruit institutional investors. Resource Renewable Group in, in California uh, just finished a gigantic capital raise uh, focused on both sustainable agriculture and water resource plays, uh, water trade plays. Uh, in California, Chile, and Australia, and they were able to raise a $900 million fund. Uh, we're also beginning to see groups like Quantified Ventures and Blue Forest uh, get beyond their pilot transactions into repeatable transactions in the pay for success or pay for outcomes space. 
And uh, th that will mean as those vehicles grow in scale, they'll become attractive to larger scale, uh, perhaps even institutional investors. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, even some NGOs have entered this space. Uh, almost 20 years ago, EcoTrust, a nonprofit based in Portland, Oregon, created a for profit forest land investment subsidiary. They're in their third fund, have made investments in three states. Um, NatureVest uh, is the impact investing arm of the Nature Conservancy. Uh, they are best known for their well, they're, they're known for a lot of good things, uh, including uh, some of their recent debt for nature swaps with island nations. But just in the last year, their Cumberland Forest project in uh, Virginia and Tennessee and Kentucky uh, was able to raise a mixture of private capital as well as uh, inexpensive debt from a program related investment from the Darcy Travel Foundation and loans from the state revolving loan funds in Kentucky and Virginia. Um, we, I mentioned CDFIs. I'm always jealous of the uh, complicated and, and uh, interesting financing mechanisms that they bring to the table. Uh, Calvert Impact is. Uh, sort of a CDFI, almost a CDFI, but has been playing a role in this space for a long time. The Natural Capital Investment Fund, which is related to the Conservation Fund, Coastal Enterprises in Maine, uh, these have all been CDFI-like entities that have participated in land conservation debt mechanisms. Uh, and then uh, the ones that I remain most jealous of are Enterprise Foundation and Local Initiative Support Corporation, because they also have the ability to use uh, a federal income tax credit associated with low income housing. Let's go to the next slide. Um, Brad mentioned this at the very end of his uh, transaction while I've attempted to compartmentalize uh, many of these financing mechanisms and fu funding techniques, they tend to, um, I'll use a very technical term, mush together from time to time. Uh, and uh, the project that I'm gonna go into in the next slide is an example of blending profit-seeking capital, low-cost debt, natural resource damage assessment payments, program-related investments uh, with state and federal public grant funding. So that's a pretty much blended transaction. Uh, would not have happened uh, candidly if, uh, if one of those seven sources was not available to make this transaction work. Uh, so let's go into the next slide. In uh, the Northwest corner of Wisconsin is the tannish color area shown on this map, it's approximately 73,000 acres of timberland formerly owned by the Wausau Paper Company. I mentioned the divestiture by the publicly traded forest products companies, paper companies over time. Well, we, we're pretty sure Wausau Paper Company was the last one to get that advice or to read the, the memo from their investment bankers about this. And they decided in uh, 2011 that they wanted to do a very significant capital upgrade to a tissue mill that they owned in Kentucky and wanted to sell their timberland in Wisconsin to provide the capital for that uh, investment, that upgrade. Uh, the state uh, Department of Natural Resources had identified this land as the number one conservation priority for the state of, of uh, Wisconsin. Part of the science that went into that decision was supplied by the Wisconsin chapter of the Nature Conservancy uh, and good work that was done by uh, the Coalition of Land Trusts in Wisconsin called Gathering Waters. Uh, the Conservation Fund and uh, the State Department of Natural Resources had negotiated with Wausau Paper Company in 2008 to actually do a conservation easement on this property. 
And at the last minute, uh, the uh, Wausau Paper Company backed out of that transaction, which was probably un un unfortunate, but very fortunate for Lime Timber. Uh, when this property was exposed to the market in August of 2011, um, it was exposed with a pretty short time period for the sale. They wanted to close by the end of the year. And uh, that meant that we had to act quickly and we had to uh, put together a package that allowed us to competitively bid for the property. It was not a negotiated sale. There were at least four or five other Timberland Investment Management organizations interested in this property. Uh, we reached out and reached agreement with the Conservation Fund to be partners on this. Their role was to uh, initially provide some of the debt financing that we needed for this at a concessionary rate. But most importantly, they were also going to be facilitating the interactions with local government agencies uh, and state for the pursuit of the conservation transactions if we were the successful bidder. It turns out we were the successful bidder. Um, we were able to acquire the property uh, by the end of the year, uh, at the end of 2011. Uh, we used $21 million of equity, meaning capital, uh, from our fund. It was the Lime Forest Fund 3. Uh, and uh, we borrowed $16 million from the Conservation Fund. In, in all fairness to the Conservation Fund, when we went to borrow that amount of money, they said, oh, we don't quite have that amount of money. And together, the Conservation Fund and Lime Timber approached the McKnight Foundation in Minneapolis. They made a program-related investment to the Conservation Fund that allowed them to provide that additional debt, got it up to $16 million. Uh, Probably most importantly for land trusts out there trying to wonder why in the world a for-profit entity is allowed to borrow money at less than market rates from a nonprofit. Uh, well, if we didn't do anything to close the gap, so to speak, uh, to provide a value that uh, suggests uh, that we deserve to get low-cost debt, we wouldn't be allowed to do it. So that loan earned the Conservation Fund three things. Earned them a term easement during the life of the loan. Lime Timber had to manage the property as if a perpetual working forest conservation easement was on the property. Second, it earned the conservation fund the right to acquire in phases a conservation easement over the property at preset strike prices, provided they were supported by appraisals. Uh, and third, it gave the right to the conservation fund to acquire about 2,500 acres in fee, which were of interest to some county forest preserves and the state park system, where a, a few sections of this property were actually in holdings in uh, county uh, fee simple forest preserves and state park fee simple ownerships in this part of the state. Let's go to the next slide. Um, as with all of the property owned by Lime Timber, we secured third party certification. In this case, it's duly certified by both the Sustainable Forestry Initiative and the Forest Stewardship Council. Uh, we were fortunate that we sold the first phase of conservation easement a year earlier than we expected. That was uh, exclusively, well, it was paid for with, with uh, Knowles Nelson Stewardship Funds, state of Wisconsin monies. Uh, and then uh, with a lot of help from the Conservation Fund, the Nature Conservancy, Gathering Waters, the Congressional Delegation, state agencies, uh, a mixture of federal forest legacy program money and state money paid for the second phase of conservation easement. Uh, this was a lot of fun. It happened during uh, a, uh, the administration, well, first, uh, we were negotiating for the acquisition of the property during uh, Scott Walker's recall election. That was a lot of fun. Uh, and then secondly, uh, he withstood that recall, but was not known uh, the way I described him. Is he, for some reason, his parents did not read him the Sand County Almanac. Uh, so he was not all that well uh, attuned to conservation or the history of conservation in Wisconsin. And um, 
I had the wonderful opportunity of, of uh, having two minutes of speaking time at the ribbon cutting on the second phase. And it was very clear from his press uh, assistant that I was not allowed to use the word conservation during my talk. And so I couldn't say it was a conservation easement. I couldn't say it was the largest conservation project in the history of Wisconsin, um, but I found other words. So um, in addition to the conservation easement transactions and the fee sales for public conservation land, uh, there were about uh, between five and 6,000 acres of what were called orphan properties, properties that did not connect to the million acres of existing conservation land that this property was embedded into that we had to acquire from Wausau paper as a condition of our transaction. And we basically sold about half of that, um, went to state and local units of government, and the other half went to retail purchasers who were looking to buy a 40-acre or 80-acre hunting camp. In uh, we then managed the property for the next uh, five or six years. Uh, and candidly, we did not want to sell it in 2017. I have a long history of falling in love with everything that Lime Timber buys, and I don't really love getting rid of it. But we were approached uh, by Hancock Timber Resource Group, um, a much larger timber investment management organization, who had a client who wanted uh, geographic exposure to the lake states. And uh, we had added another 13,000 acres to this ownership and it could serve those acres as well. And the uh, entire property, about 85,000 acres, was sold to uh, Hancock Timber Resource Group in 2017. So Lime Timber no longer owns this property, but in uh, the fourth quarter of, we missed Wisconsin. So in the fourth quarter of uh, last year, we acquired land on the uh, Upper Peninsula adjacent to the properties we acquired in Michigan uh, at the end of last year as well. So let's go to the next slide to show how it all came together. Well, no, not that slide, this slide, yep. Uh, so Wausau Paper Company is selling it to Lime Timber. We're borrowing money from the Conservation Fund and we're using the equity, the capital that is provided to us by high net worth families and individuals, public and private pension funds, uh, foundation and college endowments, and a handful of fund of funds that invest with us. Uh, that goes into the purchase. Uh, we create value by uh, developing a management plan that uh, takes into consideration the restrictions or conditions imposed by the conservation easement. We're returning capital quite early, in this case, during the first three and a half years in two pretty large tranches to our investors through the sale of conservation easements. We maintained a wood supply agreement with Wausau, so they still got the fiber they needed for their mill that is located nearby. Uh, we still had some recreational lease income with hunt clubs, uh, and then we had the retail sales to both conservation entities, in this case, county forest preserves and then the state park system and to retail buyers. Uh, this was uh, more or less a home run transaction for Lime Timber, and uh, we would not have been able to do it absent the extremely deep and strong partnership we had with the Conservation Fund, with uh, staff of the Wisconsin chapter of TNC, uh, with the state agency, particularly the real estate, uh, end of the Department of Natural Resources for the state of Wisconsin, uh, and that coalition of land trusts, which was really, really good on the state legislator education role. Um, working forest conservation easements were still somewhat of a new idea uh, in Wisconsin, and uh, putting money into that type of land tenure was something that needed a bit of explaining and um, and uh, Gathering Waters was really helpful at explaining that to legislative committees. So let's go to the final slide. Thank you. And uh, I believe that Allegra is going to orchestrate Q&A. Sure. Um, so I'll just remind folks uh, one more time to put any questions that you might have into the Q&A box. 
But while we're waiting for some of those questions to percolate, um, I just want to highlight a couple of the organizations that Peter mentioned in his presentation will actually be featured um, in the sessions on Thursday of this week. So we're going to have Keith Bisson with CEI, which is a CDFI. He's going to be speaking about their role in conservation um, on Thursday afternoon. We're also going to have Dylan Jenkins with Finite Carbon. He'll be talking about some of the evolutions in carbon markets and also get a little bit into you know, what the voluntary carbon market is going to look like in a post-COVID world. Uh, we're going to have Mark Lambert with Quantified Ventures. Peter mentioned Quantified Ventures briefly. Um, they're pioneering some pay for performance projects in the conservation sector. Um, and we'll also have, who else? Well, I think that's a good overview of some of the people that Peter mentioned. Um, so with that, we could jump right into the Q&A, but I want to give Lee and Brad a chance as well to add any final points on what Peter discussed just now. Lee, you want to go first? I suppose I'll enter the conversation somewhere between Peter and Allegra just to say, you know, this presentation has really been our attempt to provide somewhat of a full story arc of where some of the advent of these funding and financing tools have come from, how they're capitalized or where the actual money comes from, particularly in the case of, well, really any of the tools, if it's public funding, if it's private finance. Um, we know that we can't give you the entire um, brain trust's worth <laughs> in four webinar sessions, but, you know, I think you've picked up this session is meant to really pique curiosity and give a little bit of a mental filing cabinet uh, for, some of the, for some of the types of tools. Um, I've seen a couple comments come through the chat box so far on folks really looking to increase some of their financial understandings, financial literacy and acumen. So that'll be the session this afternoon and we really hope folks will stick around to hear Peter's colleague, David Hoffer. Um, and then we're gonna really take a bunch of the terms and concepts from today. And in addition to the speakers that Allegra was talking through, highlight in many presentations, some grounded case examples of where and how these things are being experimented, piloted, scaled, what have you, put into practice across the country. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, but just to contextualize a bit where we're going from here. I guess the, the things that I would emphasize are, I was glad Peter mentioned the health and nature connection, particularly in these COVID times, because either health organizations, community health organizations are gonna start putting more money into programming around natural areas, or they might actually be more willing to invest in trails and things like that. Or they can be more important political allies making arguments at the municipal and state level about why funding in this area is so important. And that then sort of takes me into another area, which is the urban side of this. If you think about a lot of what we've been talking about is in rural areas, but you're starting to see much more attention being paid to the multiple benefits of green infrastructure and in cities, linking to parks and health and water and temperature and all sorts of things in those areas. So those will be areas that people are experimenting with as well. Finally, I've just sort of been watching the chat. There's a wonderful set of cross connections I think that can be made. And that's certainly been a big part of the boot camp experiences bringing people together to, to talk to each other in ways that they might not have found otherwise. So I believe that Allegra and Lee are gonna save the chat and try to follow up with or help to um, connect folks who are interested in cross connecting with others who are in attendance. And that's a really valuable part as well. So I think I'll stop there, Lee. Yeah, it's, it's hard to recreate the in-person boot camp via chat on a webinar, but we definitely appreciate everyone introducing themselves, talking about what they're working on, asking questions. That's probably as close as we'll get, but uh, we do appreciate folks engaging in that way. Um, so we've had 
Yep. Well, I just want to say that uh, through through this virtual experience, uh, you will through uh, literally through Allegra and Lee. I think both Brad and I can be contacted in the future. Um, I'm really good at avoiding answering questions, but giving uh, contact to the right person uh, who can answer your question, uh, the so-called subject matter expert that I might know. So uh, we wanna make sure you know that you can do that as well. Great, so with that, we got a couple of really good questions in the Q&A, so we can flip over to that. Um, so first of all, we got a question from Bethany Mueller. Uh, she's just interested in learning a little bit more about DAFs and trends in using DAFs donor advised funds in conservation. Uh, I know we talk about this a lot and the potential for donor advised funds. So love to hear some comments on that. Um, well, I'll start. Um, I'm a big fan uh, of uh, putting the, um, those assets to work. I think we explained, I explained earlier what a donor advised fund is. Uh, it's a way to create a charitable gift uh, at sort of the wholesale level and then uh, the manager of the donor advised fund, which might be a community foundation, it might be a group like Impact Assets, it might be a group like uh, Calvert Impact Capital, it might be a group like the Tides Foundation, it might be a for-profit like Fidelity uh, or uh, Schwab or Vanguard. Um, and it's a way to do uh, your grant making. But uh, a number of DAFs uh, pioneered in some ways by the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, pioneers in, pioneered in other ways by uh, the community foundation that my wife sits on the board of, the Vermont Community Foundation in partnership with Vermont Land Trust have begun to allow DAF advisors to recommend investments uh, for the DAFs. And the, the most streamlined way of doing this is actually uh, now through the Fidelity uh, for-profit DAF management scheme that is run by CapShift. So um, Googling CapShift would be a great way to start, uh, but there are examples uh, all around the country. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm happy to follow up with more specific examples if that would help. Great. Um, another really good question related to crowdsource fundraising, which I think we mentioned briefly. Uh, so Dario is wondering, you know, is crowdsourced funding, fundraising usually focused on donations or on micro investments? And if it is micro investments, can those be open to non accredited investors? I know there's a huge landscape of crowdfunding, so we could maybe just chat a little bit about the nuances of that model. Yeah, I'm better versed. There's a, at the very end of the Obama administration, um, legislation was created and passed that allowed for essentially securities and exchange commission leniency with respect to uh, allowing non-accredited investors um, invest in social enterprise. I can't give you the site right now for that legislation, but it's still available. <laughs> uh, and uh, meaning that there are funds um, that are structured to take, take advantage of that. And uh, I, I do know that folks at Mission Investor Exchange have a lot of resources on this. Great, Brad and Lee, anything to add to that? I was just thinking, I was trying to find the name of the group that used to be called Raise Green which is doing crowdfunding from a for-profit point of view for community solar projects. Um, what I've seen more in the land conservation or community garden tree planting areas is through groups like Sustainable Connecticut, which is co-sponsoring a crowdfunding for community-based climate-related, sustainability-related projects in their town. They're working at the moment with IOBI the in our, in our Backyards crowdfunding platform, but there are a number of platforms around there for the donation side of things. And I'll just add on to Brad's comments. I think as we've discussed with some of the groups on the ground who have experience with crowdfunding platforms, 
So more of what you know, Brad was talking about, kind of the in our backyard type platforms. Um, sometimes it's just a different way of accessing people's wallets. So you know, it's it's still in the realm of philanthropy. You're still asking people for money, um, and we found sometimes it's useful for groups to think about it not in terms of accessing some huge different pot of funding, but for increasing visibility um, and kind of connecting to volunteers, particularly with communities or age brackets that maybe haven't been on the traditional donor roles. So just to add that layer in. Great. Uh, those are some really good responses. So we have a really good question about debt. Uh, Claire is wondering if you all could speak a little bit more about opportunities for firms to access debt financing at a concessionary rate to cover the timeline associated with conservation transactions. And then to add to that, also, how do you handle the risk that public funding won't come through? Great question. <laughs> um, so I think we mentioned a couple of groups that, that are out there uh, who are doing bridge financing, this type of debt financing. Um, uh, Lee and Michelle and Allegra's colleagues at the Conservation Fund would be a great starting point. Uh, the loan uh, and regrant team at the Open Space Institute would be another uh, good point. Uh, depending on what geography, uh, there are folks uh, at Resource Legacy Fund in Sacramento who would be worth talking to. Uh, the, you know, for a variety of reasons, if the, the permanent conservation takeout or funding is 25 years away, hmm, it's probably a short conversation. Uh, but what I'm talking about is, you know, one to three year, one to four year debt financing, bridge financing. And uh, the groups that I mentioned uh, all have, you know, remarkably robust ways of understanding and analyzing risk. Uh, they have a track record of making good loans. Uh, they'll tell you up front whether you're not a candidate so they don't waste your time uh, and you don't waste their time. Uh, that's sort of uh, at the wholesale level. There are direct relationships that land trusts have had with individual lenders. Uh, there are also direct relationships that land trusts have had with individual foundations making program related investments, so loans from foundations that don't go through intermediaries. Uh, so I think, uh, I think starting, uh, depending on your geography, starting with a group like the Conservation Fund or Open Space Institute or Norcross Wildlife Foundation or um, Resource Legacy Fund would be a good first step. And if you want a little bit more on that, we're not going to get into it in depth on Thursday, but um, we on the website have a toolkit really framed around an orientation to the use of bridge finance for exactly that purpose. Great. Um, this next question uh, is actually something that we debated talking about in this presentation and decided to remove. So Peter and Lee are both smiling, but we have a good question from Namrita about the role of technology and conservation finance. Um, we work with a couple of different groups that are exploring different ways that tech can be used in service of conservation finance. So Peter, Lee and Brad love to hear some of those examples and trends that we're seeing. I can give you like a real example from the last two weeks. That's perfect. So uh, because of travel restrictions associated with the pandemic, um, Lime Timber is evaluating a property in Eastern Oregon for a strategy that's part of one of our funds. We're looking at so-called carbon centric forests, forests that have a density of trees or a stocking level of trees that exceed the regional average. Um, and he, there's a tried and true way of figuring that out, which is you send a whole bunch of people into the woods and they take sample plots and they count the trees and they put them into a model and you get 
about 95% accuracy, but it takes a lot of time and a lot of people and you got to go there. Well, nobody could go there. Um, so by buying an air, well, renting time on an airplane with LIDAR and using machine learning from Oxford University, <laughs> we were able to do a pretty robust calculation of stand density on a uh, 12,000 acre forest in about three days uh, at a fraction of the cost of a field verification or field inventory. Eventually, we will have to spot check it with a field crew, but it gave us the confidence to go forward uh, with this investment. Uh, so that's an example of technology. And then uh, with hopefully not stealing too much of, of Lee's thunder here, there are a couple of groups that that the Conservation Finance Network stays close to have been really using technology to focus conservation investments and public funding for conservation. The groups that come to mind are the Freshwater Trust in Portland, Oregon, uh, Chesapeake Conservancy in Annapolis, Maryland, um, and Upstream Technology in Boston, Cambridge. Um, and I think just connecting to those groups, you'll begin to see land trusts who are using remote sensing to do their monitoring of conservation easements, land trusts who are using remote sensing to produce their baseline documentation for conservation easements. Uh, a lot of work about, a lot of effort in, uh, in at the sort of meter square scale of focusing conservation uh, practices to yield the highest outcomes. Um, so, that's where I would start. And I think when we, when we kind of noodle through where technology fits in, um, exactly where Peter's been talking about it, you can think about it in terms of management improvements, you can think about it in terms of cost savings. There are really a bunch of different, <laughs> as broad as the different types of uh, technological app applications are, um, you see the kind of strategy around their use differing greatly. But it's, it has been very interesting to see um, projects start to recruit the use of different forms of tech for various aspects of, of management or process or monitoring. Um, some other examples we've seen are the use of cloud-based smart sensors for city stormwater management. Um, and really getting some process and efficiency improvements there. So not per se a funding and financing, you know, technique, but definitely something that complements the toolkit. If you think about the carbon offsets area, I think you're starting to see more technology going into there for some of the reasons Peter was talking about. We're just, one of the things that is a big issue around forest carbon offsets is what constitutes permanence. Is it 100 years? Is it 20 years? Is it 10 years? And how do you set it up so that it's attractive to landowners to participate in the program? One of the ideas around really good remote sensing technology is could you shift to 10 years and measure it every year cost effectively? So you get paid for the 10 years for that, for that time, recognizing that over time, the forest will always change. The other aspect where there's seems to be more work with blockchain is to avoid double counting of offsets or emission reductions around forests. So I think that that's built into aspects of what the Red Plus group for the new um, forest carbon sponsored by nation states in the tropics. Uh, the Red Plus platform, I believe they're heading in that direction now on avoiding double counting. Great. And yep. we did have a, a comment about what about drones come in through the chat box. So I'll just tack that on to this conversation. I think sometimes as an aerial monitoring tool, we've seen applicability. Um, and I know that it's been a powerful tool, particularly as a landowner can actually drive the drone and help with some of the aerial surveillance. Um, and then, you know, we focus primarily in the US, uh, but We've seen some really fascinating examples of drones being used to assist with the reduction of human wildlife conflict, uh, for example, with elephant populations. So, you know, it's, it's kind of dependent on the project, but we are seeing a, a lot of um, new applications to assist with some type of project structure. My impression is it sort of depends on altitude and scale. 
drones lower, planes next, satellites next, bigger and bigger, but not necessarily finer resolution because you get pretty remarkable resolution at the satellite level now. Yep, and you can bet that with every year boot camp, we're gonna have more and more stuff about tech as it develops and applicability. So really good question. Um, we have another good question from Dennis who is wondering if we might be able to speak to any nascent or successful examples of conservation finance being applied in a tribal context. And to share a little bit more context on Dennis's question uh, for his work, he's working with partners at the Rosebud Reservation to establish the country's largest native owned and managed bison herd and looking for mechanisms to bring greater investment to establishing more economically, culturally, and ecologically sustainable bison herds uh, for the tribes. So obviously that's specific to Dennis's work, but I imagine there's more than one person on this call looking to uh, bring more tribal engagement into their work around conservation finance. So love to hear if you all have any thoughts on that or examples. Um. Some examples come to mind in, um, in Arizona, uh, Encourage Capital did a very large forest carbon transaction a couple of years ago that yielded um, the White Apache tribe more than $40 million of carbon offset proceeds. Um, much more recently, New Forests, uh, which is a timber investment management organization headquartered in Australia, but with a significant U.S. operation based in San Francisco, uh, did a major tribal forest uh, investment in, uh, in Oregon and California. Uh, Forterra, has, uh, which is a multi-faceted uh, land trust type group, uh, used to be known as Cascade Land Conservancy based in Seattle, has a, a fair amount of experience with the Yakima tribe. Uh, and so I think there's quite a bit of work going on. Um, uh, Montana chapter of the Nature Conservancy with the Blackfoot Reservation. There's been a, a, a good amount of work lately um, in bringing some of these conservation finance mechanisms to uh, tribal geographies, including uh, just re recreating the tribal ownership. So uh, taking what is was tribe tribally owned property um, that for a variety of reasons due to crazy public policies in America was lost to the tribe and uh, essentially repatriating it. Um, there is a, a tribal natural resource center at the University of New Mexico that kind of tracks a lot of these things. Uh, and there are some community development finance institutions that focus on tribal issues as well. And it's also an intersection where new markets tax credit financing can work. And that may be a good pivot. We've had a couple questions come through on new markets tax credit. Um, so Allegra, not to- Well, uh, does Brad have anything to add to that or? Sure. Yeah, then we can pivot to the new market tax credits if we want to uh, answer those questions. Sure. And so I think, uh, Peter, folks are looking for a word on the experience directly of using new markets tax credits. There's a bit of nuance in the questions, but if you would just want to start with um, <laughs> scale, complexity, is it worth it? Um, those are all good questions. Actually, pretty critical questions. The uh, since someone's daughter on this phone call is a legal expert on new markets, tax credit uh, mechanisms and financings and structures, I have to be a little careful, but um, if you are thinking about using new markets, tax credits, the, the most fundamental, the two fundamental issues, one is the geography has to qualify and you can easily figure that out by going to the community development finance institution part of the US Treasury website, and there's a map and it's based on economic distress of census tracts. So you can immediately determine whether your location works, but that's not good enough. There has to be someone, uh, typically a community development finance institution, which could be a nonprofit or could be a for-profit, 
who has an allocation of these tax credits that could be available for you to use and partner with. Uh, that's a more difficult um, and not easily determinable challenge. But uh, there are networks of CDFIs. Um, there are folks like uh, Coastal Enterprises that works nationally, not just in Maine, on this. Uh, so you can get an answer to that, but it takes a few more emails. Um, and then there's the brain damage. If you were going to do this to borrow two or three million dollars, there's got to be a, another thing you could do. Uh, the soft costs and time associated with creating the structures, paying the legal fees, paying the administrative fee to the CDFI, uh, what looks like low cost financing will not be low cost financing. So it's probably, it's probably hard for at least me to imagine doing this when you're not going to be borrowing uh, less than $10 million, you know, maybe seven or $8 million, but it's going to be close to $10 million as a minimum threshold to absorb the soft costs and time challenges, the time sink of, of doing this. Uh, the good news is it's been now been done about 25 times with a land conservation outcome. Uh, Lime Timber either was lucky or unlucky to have done one of the very first ones. That took a lot more time. But that was in 2005, so that's 15 years ago. Uh, so uh, there are at least uh, 10 CDFIs who have experience on working lands, new markets tax credit financings. And uh, since he's going to be on Thursday's webinar, a great place to get connected to a CDFI is to work through Keith at, uh, at Coastal Enterprises. Peter, what are you seeing with opportunity zones? And very, very thing? difficult uh, from our perspective. There may be others. Um, again, uh, not as quite as science driven in the locations. A little more politics got involved in designing opportunity zones like, you know, West 48th to West 54th Street in Manhattan is an opportunity. Like, how does that work? But anyway. Um, the problem for us is we have a collection of capital that's going to make investments in land that may be an opportunity zone and lands that are not in opportunity zones. And segregating that is impossible. The way we've looked at opportunity zones is, does that improve uh, the viability of an exit? So we happen to own 90,000 acres uh, sort of in the panhandle of Florida. It's all in an opportunity zone. When we go to exit that investment, will we find it attractive for some of the opportunity zone funds to be at our exit? I think when you mentioned urban uh, issues and urban work, I think there may be a better chance to find a connection in opportunity zone work in cities than in the countryside. So we'll do maybe one or two more questions, depending on time, and then I'll have one question for wrap up as well. Uh, but we got an interesting question from Joss, and he's looking for tools that he could use to identify financing opportunities during the planning stage of projects. So I'm going to interpret this, a question, this question a little bit, but I think, you know, what folks might be interested in learning more about is you have an idea, you need to do the research and kind of understand the feasibility. How do you get resources to do that very beginning stage of, you know, figuring out if you have a conservation finance project or not? Curious if you all have any thoughts on resources okay. or ideas there. Could I push that over to you, Allegra, or to Lee? An example would be the conservation innovation grants at NRCS. Yeah, Lee, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I'm just looking at the question. Um, is it about identifying the potential for finance as you are just planning the project as opposed to planning the project and then picking your head up and thinking about how the heck you're going to pay for it? Um, and I might just, I might just pivot not to talk about the Conservation Innovation Grant Program, but 
maybe Peter and Brad to lean on some of your experience on um, actually thinking through project planning from the perspective of anticipating where there will be both funding and financing resources available. So um, as far as tools to help with the planning, I think groups that we've worked with have often developed their own. Um, we've heard of groups that use a spreadsheet and just have a list of different potential funding and financing sources. And anytime they have a project idea before they get to the planning stage, they kind of run through, you know, red light, yellow light, green light for what might be appropriate for a given project. Um, but well, I, there's enough. Yeah, I, the other thing that's happened, and I think it's great, is the, the ecosystem has gotten a little fuller, a little more robust. We now have uh, incubators and accelerators. Uh, so particularly related to the question asked by Jost, there might be an opportunity, uh, their nature vest had an accelerator for a while. I think the funding has ended for that, but the Nature Conservancy has a natural climate solutions accelerator that might touch on this. There are a couple of other accelerators out there. So I think that um, this kind of pre-development sort of strategic planning area uh, can sometimes be supported through enrollment and, you know, it's a competitive process. You've got to get selected, but through these incubators and accelerators. The other area is, um, and my colleagues at Lime may be kicking me virtually under the table, but many times uh, if there is an opportunity to partner with private profit-seeking capital, then you're going to ask for a fair amount of work and diligence <laughs> in developing that partnership from the private investment partner. And uh, I know that we have done exactly this kind of work when we're looking at opportunities that might be brought to us by a land trust. And, you know, we have a, a long list of questions as well as conceptual ideas to solve those questions and what is really going to have uh, traction and be viable in the individual example that we're looking at. Great. Let's do one more question from the Q&A and then we'll do the wrap up question. Um, but we have a question. Oh, it's from an anonymous attendee. A question about carbon offsets and how they're valued when you're acquiring a property. Um, and, you know, Dylan might talk a little bit about this on Thursday, but uh, curious to know if carbon offsets are given a value when you're acquiring the property, if the value is just based on the appraisal. Um, and if lenders or investors consider carbon offsets as part of the asset or acquisition uh, that they make. So uh, I'll go first, and I'm, I'm sure Brad will, and maybe Lee will have something to add. The, um, this is a question that probably should be asked like every single year going forward. <laughs> um, and again, this is from Lime Timber's experience and background. We were, we've been doing carbon offset projects uh, for exactly 10 years. Uh, and quite candidly, we did not model the carbon opportunity till about five years ago. So, uh, and very, very few appraisals reflect carbon value at this point in time. But I'm not, maybe I was wrong. Maybe this question should be asked every six months because the field is emerging. And uh, unless you hide carbon transactions, which you can't because there's a, a public register <laughs> at the Air Resources Board in California, and each of the voluntary protocols have a public register, you're going to begin to see more activity in the carbon markets. And eventually, landowners will become better informed, and a certain aspect or element of their the valuing of their property will now be based or eventually be based on carbon value. Uh, is it happening in the appraisal process today? Very infrequently. That's, but I'd love to think about answering this question six months, 12 months, 18 months from now, because uh, uh, you know, just look at the volume of carbon transactions the last two years compares, compared to the last eight years. Uh, more transactions in the last two years than the last eight years. So. And if we haven't hyped Thursday enough, 
Um, there's a reason that uh, Dylan with finite carbon has been such a long standing faculty with boot camp, and that is that he really tracks these trends and dynamics, both for the compliance offset market and for the voluntary offset market. And um, we happen to know, uh, because we asked him uh, to speak to it, that that'll be part of his spiel on Thursday. And though we won't have time to get to your question, Marcelo, um, it, he'll, he'll speak to the dynamic too of where and how private capital can come into some of these payments for ecosystem service markets. So where you actually have, you know, not what we ought to pay for something, but where that unit is being bought and sold. So um, stay tuned for more is I guess where I'm headed with that. Great. Well, this has been a really fantastic set of questions. Um, I'm going to take moderator privilege for the wrap up question, but kind of steal from, I think it was Dario's question in the Q&A. But, you know, this is always a great presentation that we do every year at the boot camp where we talk about what we're seeing, trends, you know, new deals, new projects that have come out over the past year or so. Um, I'd love to hear from the three of you, you know, what trends are most exciting to you? Uh, what innovations are really catching your attention? Uh, maybe a year from now at boot camp number 15, uh, what we might all be most excited to talk about. Just love to hear your thoughts on that. So if I can start, I'm really interested in where the nature-based solutions or the natural climate solutions will go and whether that will take us into the sort of multi-benefit, co-benefit analysis in ways that actually allow that to be monetized. Um, certainly as companies and states are committing to net zero goals, they're gonna need to have some negative emission technologies as part of that. The easiest way to do that is to have forests and natural lands in. I mean, as they think about urban resilience from a flooding and a temperature point of view, natural areas are gonna to have to fit there. And as we saw in COVID, access to natural areas goes a long way to helping health. So you've always, all of a sudden got a whole bunch of different areas where people will be putting money in ways that we don't yet understand. So it's almost like, Peter, it's every three months, maybe not every six months that we have to ask these questions. I think, yeah, just building on what, what Brad just said, I think then uh, blending in uh, some of the public financing mechanisms, uh, we have seen just in the last year or two a, a dramatic expansion around the country in letting uh, both local governments, state governments, uh, and nonprofits, and in one example, a private for profit entity, access the uh, safe drinking water and clean water state revolving funds. Um, in, uh, in the case of, of nature based climate solutions, that may be blended in as well. Uh, when there is a discrete, measurable, authentic water quality benefit that goes alongside. And some of the work that's going on by Quantified Ventures, again on Thursday, we're going to have Mark Lampert from Quantified Ventures, uh, the kind of remarkable work that is being done in a, in a voluntary mechanism, but it is allowing a global corporate to meet their scope three goals for carbon reduction. Uh, by making payments to farmers in Iowa. There happens to be a, a water quality benefit as well. And part of that is being paid for by municipal water authorities. So I, it, it may be a, this 90 day cycle is exactly how we have to keep track of these things. Uh, from my end, I just continue to be excited by the nexus of, you know, where we're starting to see different types of funding and financing tools, not just those from conservation, but community development, from agriculture. We're really seeing um, the applicability of both projects and tools come together to solve um, problems more holistically, to really think more broad based, and perhaps not to, you know, always just chase the, the new and shiny and innovative tool or project structure, but also to really expand the use of things that we know to be effective. So, um, yeah. Great. 
Well, this has been a wonderful first session for our boot camp webinar series. So I want to thank Lee, Peter, and Brad for your presentation. And also thank you to everyone for joining us on the line. We'll be back in about an hour for the second webinar in our series, which will be Principles of Finance. So we'll see you all then. Thank you so much. Thanks, folks.